Mr. Jeffrey, we need to uh, put on, turn, turn off your camera. Say it again. Is that what you're saying?
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ninth annual TEDx Rush U event, minor setback, major comeback. TEDx Rush U provides a platform for the brightest minds to converge and inspire. We are committed to creating an event where participants are challenged to communicate their passions in an exciting and engaging dialogue. The event is in honor of Mayor Patel, an alumni of Rush University's Health Systems Management Program, who unexpectedly passed away in 2011, an individual who cherished the power of ideas and embraced the principles TEDx stands for. This year's TEDx Rush U theme is Minor Setback, Major Comeback, where seven TEDx speakers will teach us how our obstacles inspire resilience to build a better tomorrow. Speakers will present their forward-thinking ideas, and all participants will leave the conference inspired and empowered to create positive change. We are extremely honored to have a diverse group of speakers with us tonight, and the event will consist of two parts, with a brief intermission featuring a special performance in between. We welcome all audience members to submit any questions that they have to the chat, and if time permits, we will address them at the end of the show. Before I introduce our first speaker, on behalf of all of us here at TEDx Rush U, we also want to thank you, the audience, for spending your Thursday night with us. We would not be able to have such a well-attended event if it wasn't for your support, so thank you. Without further ado, our first speaker for the evening is Dr. Jeffrey Mount Barner. His talk is titled, Teaching You to Never Fail and 27 Different Emotions. Jeffrey Mount Varner is an ER doctor who has practiced and led in trauma settings and healing environments for over 25 years. In his many years of treating patients in critical life and death situations, he has learned this to be true. Pain or setbacks will happen to us all. In fact, they are required lessons for a successful life. Additionally, he understands that managing this one emotion allows your setback to become your shield. The setup for your comeback. In his talks, he shares how you can learn to never fail. In addition to his work as an ER physician, Dr. Jeffrey is a multi best selling author, executive, and a split second decisions expert. His executive leadership includes international crisis work on Ebola, Hurricane Katrina. He's chief of a large urban level one trauma center, and he's worked on the front lines of COVID-19. Dr. Jeffrey holds degrees and medical training from Harvard, Hampton, Wayne State, George Washington University of Maryland, shock trauma, and Johns Hopkins Universities. He is the author of the bestsellers, Training Your Mind for Split Second Decisions, and Home Alive, 11 Steps for Surviving Police Encounters. Take it away, Jeffrey. Close your eyes. We are about to go on a journey. This journey, it's gonna be a very dangerous journey. It's gonna be filled with pain, fear, and failure. With your eyes closed, raise your hands as a sign that you're going to join us. Open up your eyes. Before you go, I need something from you. I need you to ask yourself, do I want to be great? And then ask yourself, am I willing to be great? And then finally, here's the big one. Have I decided to be great? Because greatness is inside all of us. Wait a minute. If greatness is inside all of us, what prevents us from being great? Follow me. We have 27 different human emotions, but there's one emotion which we must learn to conquer, control, and confront if we are to be great. And that emotion is fear. That's right, fear. But hold on, you're thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. 
we were taught that fear is a learned behavior. We were, we were, we were born fearless, if that is correct. Then why are we so thrown off by fear? Follow me. After doing a little research, fear comes from our past pain and failures. That's right. Fear comes from our past pain and failures. Hence, we've got to learn to manage that. And there is no such thing as failure, really. It's just a mindset. And that's where we're going. There's no such thing as failure. It's really a mindset. So I ask you again, are you ready to join me on this journey? For which there'll be a lot of introspection around fear, pain, and failure. Let's move, because we're going to move quick. All right, I'm asking you to give, so I'm going to give. I'm going to share a story about my fear, pain, and failure. What you don't know about me is I was born a stutterer. Could not speak. I was born stuttering. I could not speak a complete sentence without stuttering until I was 35 years old and chief resident. And as you can guess, growing up a stutterer, kids can be so cruel. I recall the bullies teasing me and everybody teasing me. I recall being about three foot five, about 60 pounds, and having these bullies who were about eight feet tall, one was nine feet tall, 350 pounds, and 40 pounds. Obviously, they weren't that big, but keep in mind, as a child, things are bigger and more intense than what they really are. And so I just recall the bully, when I would speak, the bullies would tease me. And if I would say something smart, they would, they would, they would want to fight. Look, let me make it more, more real. Sit back. Imagine yourself. Go back in your mind. Imagine yourself in first, second, third, fourth grade. Remember reading class? Well, we got to read out loud. You got to see how far you could go. And you felt so good. It was fun. Think back. But to a stutterer, it was horrendous. It was scary. It was horrible. Because you would, I would stutter. And by the second word, I am stuttering. The, the bullies are teasing me. But I will, I will admit, I wish they hadn't teased me in front of the girls. But they would tease me. I would say something smart. And they would want to fight me. And by the way, just as a side note, we think that GPS was, uh, was like recently started. I would argue that bullies had GPS back in the 70s. Why? Because when I would hide, the bullies would always, always find me. They would always hide me. I mean, they would always find me because I didn't want to read. I didn't want to read in reading class. So I would hide principals in the principal's office, in the nursing office. But they would always find me because they were looking for me. That's okay. That's okay. Because not only was it the bullies who caused a lot of fear, who, who caused a lot of pain, but then there was the failures. You know, I would go out for the school play. I wouldn't get it because I would stutter. But then one day I had to make up my mind. I made a decision. I have to admit, it wasn't just me. It was God and my parents. I made a decision in my mind. Hey, I'm not going to let this define me. I'm not going to let this be painful for me. I'm not going to let these failures just keep coming. So at my school, everyone was allowed to do, to, to, to do the morning announcements. The first couple of times I passed it. But when I made up the decision in my mind, I went to principal's office and did the morning announcements over the microphone. I stuttered my way through that. It was almost I heard the whole school laughing. Because remember, as a child, things are more intense. But in my mind, it was a success. I had done it. I had actually done the morning announcements. I was ready. And keep in mind, as a stutterer, it also, the, the teachers saw what was going on. They would see the bullying and pause. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a black male. No matter how, no matter what you think about the world, the educational system treats us differently. Unpause. But as a result of the stutter, teachers, they were concentrated. They were focused on me. They, they would hide me in plain daylight. They would give me special attention. And as a stutterer, every single word you've got to concentrate on because otherwise you're going to stutter. You've got to drown out the noise. As a stutterer, every single word you, you may stutter, it meant, it meant the bullies are going, to, are going to come and tease you. Hence, you have to have succinct 
statements, succinct sentences. In order to have succinct st statements and sentences, you gotta have succinct thoughts. Thank God for the bullies. They helped me develop my succinct thoughts. Because as a result, what happens? I go on to Hampton, major in math. I go on and go to Harvard. I go on and become an emergency medicine physician. You're talking about succinct thinking. And then because of the concentration, I go on and become a multi best selling author. Hey, what I, the stuttering was actually a blessing. Look, we all have stories. What's your story? You have a story. A few of them that are filled with pain, fear, and failure. And it's all about you changing your mindset. It's actually what we thought was put here to harm us was really put here for our good. We just have to learn that. Speaking of pain, just real quick, I recall being a uh, medical student. Now I was on the floor. Somehow I was in this patient's room by myself. This patient started, his airway started closed off. He, he like couldn't breathe. I ran to get help. I was stuttering. It was taking me a long time to like get it out. Fortunately, there was a there was a senior nurse out there who called the chief resident who was in charge because I was just a medical student. And the chief resident came, called a cold blue. They uh, saw the chief resident, lay the patient back and, and adjust the head and put a tube down the patient's mouth head to help him breathe. But obviously it was painful and fearful for me. Um, but it was, uh, but at that point, I hadn't realized what, what was sitting here to help me. I thought it was sitting here for my harm. But let's, but, but like, let's go on. Let's talk about, let's go back to this greatness thing. I ask you again, how many of you all want to be great? How many of you are willing to fail to be great? Because greatness is a mindset. It's a mindset. No. I'm not talking about a mind game. It's a mindset shift. Follow me. The greatest among us have said that it was in their failures that they learned lessons. In other words, this is the most important part. There are required lessons that we learn from our failures that are required for our success. Let me say it a, a little bit, a little bit shorter. There are required lessons of success that come from our failures. There are required lessons of success that come from our failures. Hence, you're really not failing. You're learning required lessons. Real quick, Oprah Winfrey, we all know about how great she, she is. She was fired from her first job. Why? Because she did not speak well from her very first job. Therefore, she went and took intense courses. And the next thing you know, boom, you have Oprah Winfrey. Without that failure, she would never perhaps when I've gone on to take those intense courses. You have Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb. He had 10,000 failed experiments before he created the light bulb. And even he admits each one of those 10,000 failed experiments, he, was lear he learned a lesson that got him to the next experiment and finally to the light bulb. And you have Martin Luther King, his famous, watch his famous march on Washington. And it was famous, but what you may not know about him was that Two years prior to that, he had an abysmal, a colossal, failed march on Albany, New York. But he later goes on and says, hey, the lessons I learned from my failures in New York allowed me to achieve greatness in Washington. Look, as a famous poet, Denzel Washington, am I look alike? <laughs> says, if you're not failing, then you're not trying. And if you're not trying, you're not moving towards greatness. So I ask you, are you trying? And real quick, let me help you. There are two common reasons why people are scared to fail. Number one, they're concerned what other people think about them. Number two, well, hold on, back to number one. They're concerned with what other people think about them. Answer that is what other people think about you is none of your business. Number two, <clears throat> they fail to shift their mindset. In other words, something's happened to them in the past. Something's bad, something unfortunate. And I apologize for that. And it's unfortunate, but there's nothing you can do about it. It's over. I'm not trying to be cold, but the fact is it's over. Real life, I mean, a, a real example, my bullies. You all heard about them. You all probably don't like them either now. <laughs> but there's technically nothing anyone can do about them. It's over. 
But what we can do, or what I can do, is I can learn the lessons, or I can go back and learn lessons. I mean, lessons are something I can use in my future, something that will help me, something that I can gain from what happened. Hey, whatever happened to you, I'm so sorry, but it's over. Now you've got to learn what the lessons are. And I, 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 will, I will tell you this. I'm going to teach you a process to help you identify those lessons. Follow me. Oh, but there's one nugget I do want to share with you. No pain or failure lasts forever unless you let it. Let's, let's, let me teach you how to switch your mindset such that you never fail. For <clears throat> if by Rutger Kipling, he says, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters both the same. Yes, triumph and disaster are both the same. Why? Because they are both sent here for your good. The world is moving for your good. Now, follow me on this lesson. We're going to learn to never fail, to switch our mindset. I want you to go home. You go home, find a quiet room where no one's going to bother you. Early, morning, early mornings usually work best for me. Number two, I want you to take three deep breaths. And when you're taking these deep breaths, think about something positive from the past that makes you smile. This prepares your subconscious. Three deep breaths, like. And then the next one, this is gonna be the most difficult part. I want you to think about a negative event in the past, a failure. Something that, 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 again, a negative event, but don't relive it. Don't relive the negative emotions. Don't relitigate it in your mind. Don't start asking why I mean, you're just identifying the event. And then you're going to look back and say, what should I have learned from that event? <clears throat> what could I have learned? Or what, what can I go back and think about and learn from? It? Again, what could you have learned from the event? And once you have that, because, uh, 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 write it down. Study so when you have a thought and then you write it down, it imprints on your brain. Another reason for writing it down is that now you have a success law because you're going to do this multiple times. And it's positive, really. It's a positive thought because you're learning a lesson, something that you'll be able to use for the rest of your life and you're writing it down. So this is your success law. Hey, that's how you get there. Real quick, let me go back to that story. Many A few years ago, I was working a rural ER because I still practice emergency medicine. I was working this rural ER, only doctor in the hospital at, at, at night, only doctor for miles. You know where the story is going. Patient comes in, an older lady, she comes in for, she, uh, she feels her like throat swelling. She thinks she has some kind of allergic reaction. I put an, we, they put an IV in her, we give her some IV medication. I'm thinking her throat's going to go down. It doesn't. She starts her whole way loose, so her throat's way is closing off. The next thing I know, she's turning blue. Wow. I lay her back because I need to put a tube down her mouth to, to help her breathe. I lay her back. I look. It's so swollen. I can't see anything. All right. I take a deep breath. And at that moment, it's almost like time slowed down. I thought back to that incident 20 years ago when I was a medical student sitting in the corner. I saw the resident. He pushed, her, he pushed the patient's back head to the left. He laid her back, moved her head to the left. Cocked it up about 45 degrees, put a pillow underneath her back, and took a deep breath and looked again. And when I did that, boom, there was the hole for me to put the two so it could go down to her trachea so I could breathe for her. Success! Again, what you thought was put here to harm you was really put here for your good. Now, look, look, look. but it's, it's the fear. It's the fear that we ought to have. Let's talk about fear again. Real quick, fear is you not thinking everything's going to be okay. Fear is you not thinking you're good enough. Fear is things never working out in your favor. Look, we already we already talked about it. You got to learn to confront, control, and conquer your fear because once you do that, fear is a motivator, and then you just have to deal with self doubt. The poem Invictus he says. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. 
Then he goes, in the fell clutch of circumstance, I'm not winced nor cried out loud. And then beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms but the horror of the shades, and yet the minutes of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. In the final stanza, he says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I ask you to be the master of your mindset, the master of your thoughts, so you can be the master of your fate. Be the master of your mindset as it relates to pain, fear, and failure. And that way you will be the master of your greatness. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank Jeffrey, you for sharing with us, Jeffrey. Now, let me introduce our next speaker, Dr. DeAndra Gordon, and her talk from a dream deterred to a dream deferred, having the heart to succeed. DeAndra is a visionary, advocate, creative, and servant leader from Columbus, Ohio, who believes in the power of centering humanity to achieve equity. Through her propriety, H-E-A-R-T framework, Dr. Gordon helps leaders and organizations bridge the gap between dreams and reality through cultural change, merging research, policy, and people. Her ultimate goal is to create sustainable change and inform policy to build an equitable society for people of color. Please give DeAndra a warm welcome as she joins us on this year's stage. I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise with the capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality. That was the profession we made when I was a kid. We held hands and kicked from side to side like we were on a Broadway stage. Just dancing, singing, and kicking like we attempted to, while we attempted to sing over the encouraging and exciting yells of the congregation. This was a vivid memory for me because it was a place where I felt like I belonged. Like I actually was a promise and a possibility. It is that I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise with a capital P. It's that song that subconsciously plays when I decide to take a step towards my dreams. But sometimes that song does not play loud enough and there is no preparation good enough to drown out the sounds of the rest of the world that remind me of my place as a black woman in America. I was taught as a young girl how to navigate majority white spaces. I remember being close to one of the white ladies at my daycare. She was my friend. I remember in grade school having mostly white people as students, teachers, and parents around me. I've had conversations with my parents about how they worked so hard so that they could intentionally put me in schools with white people so that I could be better prepared for success and opportunity. Growing up, I remember going into the office with my mother on the weekends and evenings when her other co-workers were at home enjoying time with their families. My mother was a part of the generation that believed that being in professional spaces with majority white people was a privilege and represented an accomplishment. I imagine how she must have been taught like she, like she also taught me how to navigate these white spaces because my mother and her siblings as children were sent as tools of civil rights to integrate schools in Tennessee. And I could only imagine what she was taught because her father was also the president of their local NAACP. I watched her navigate these white spaces as she taught me how to talk to white people, how to properly greet white people by looking them in the face, smile, and offer a firm handshake. How I was supposed to maintain a peaceful demeanor or composure, not speak too loud or be too vibrant, how to dress in an acceptable manner that does not utilize vibrant colors or anything that can be distracting. I had a lot of preparation to navigate these white spaces so that I could be successful in every environment. I was prepared with the understanding that a part of success meant that you show up differently in some places than you do in other places because it will allow others to be more comfortable around you. 
But what happens when all of those experiences and preparation to navigate these white spaces are not enough? When white people still see you as a problem? Where did all my potential go? I remember when I was getting my PhD, my advisor told me that I didn't need a PhD or even a law degree to do the work that I wanted to do. She told me that I was a horrible writer and I remember being chastised for getting a B. If that wasn't enough, she felt the need to share with another student that I made her uncomfortable because she couldn't read me. Did you know that black people make up only about 6.5% of PhDs in the US? That number gets even lower when we look at how less than 5% of lawyers in the US are black. In 2016, minority students made up 30% of first year law student enrollment, but accounted for 44% of the first year law students who didn't make it to their second year of law school. Whether it was for academic reasons, financial reasons, or for culture and climate reasons, they did not continue to their second year and they were no longer in law school on their forward journey to becoming lawyers. After taking my final exams in the second semester of my first year of law school, I held my breath for three and a half weeks while I anticipated the release of my grades. The email finally came that had informed me that I had passed all of my classes. In 2017, I was a part of that 30% of the first year of law school enrollment for minority students. But in 2018, not long after I received that email informing me that I did pass all of my classes, I had received a letter informing me that I was now a part of the 44% of first year law students who did not make it to their second year of law school. My GPA had fallen slightly below a 2.0, which meant that I had been automatically academically dismissed. The weight of that paper that I held in my hands left me breathless and heartbroken. As a black superwoman, I had failed. I did not work hard enough and achieve great enough to counteract all of the negative stereotypes that attach to black women. Despite the fact that I had documented learning dif difference, that was ignored by my law school despite asking for help and despite still applying for accommodations before taking my final exams. I have failed. These thoughts of mine might be familiar to you whether they are that of what others think about you or what you thought about yourself. It is in those times that I learned that I have to take those thoughts captive and go back to the beginning and remember what helped me to get this far. I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise with the capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality, now with a PhD and a law degree. It was up to me to decide if I was going to stay heartbroken and defeated or take the setback for a far greater comeback. Is the condition of your heart ready for the race that you are running? And the only way to find out is to do a heart check. And I have to do one heck of a heart check to bounce back from being academically dismissed. I had to implement heart. I had to hear, evaluate, assess, and redirect so that I could transform my current setback to a major comeback. For many reasons, some of us do not. Whether it is from the labels that parents put on us, the labels that we put on ourselves, the expectations of others or that that we put on ourselves, or even doors that others try to close on us. So I offer you a tool that I use, heart. First, I had to hear. I had to acknowledge what I was hearing and ascribe no value to it. What are people saying to you, around you, or even about you? What messages are you getting from your environment? What are you saying about yourself? What you hear can have the power to shape your reality, whether it initially feels good or initially feels bad. Second, I had to evaluate. I had to evaluate if those words had value in the pursuit of my dreams. My advisor told me that I did not need a PhD or a law degree to do what I wanted to do. 
My dreams were to be in a position to effectively advocate for black people so that they are properly represented in research and in policy. Do the words that you hear align with your pursuit of the change you seek to be in the world? Third, I had to assess. I had to assess what resources and tools that I had to get me to where I wanted to go. I had already been deemed a promise and a possibility, so I am telling you that because it is what is already decided for you. You have everything you need inside or around you to achieve your dreams. This looked like for me acknowledging that I had a learning difference and needed to find out more about myself and how my brain worked. Learning more about one of the tools I had, my brain, put me in position to be more successful because I now understand how my brain functions when it comes to processing, memorizing, and retaining information. So it also looked like me going to the student health clinic and seeing a therapist. I had to remember why and what got me started on this journey in the first place. I was already predestined to succeed. I wrote on my wall that my purpose was greater than myself. And sometimes I have to be reminded of that. So it is written in a place that won't let me forget. So it's on my wall, but I also have it written in my heart. Fourth, I had to redirect. I had to redirect all of my experiences to push towards progression and not perfection. In other words, I had to decide that any weapon that is formed against me, weapons of racism, weapons of bias, weapons of classism, ableism, sexism, bigotry, weapons of assumptions, stereotypes, or even diagnoses, they will form, yes, but they will not prosper. Lastly, I had to transform. I had to allow for all of my experiences, lessons, tools, and resources to unfold into a journey that might not have been how I pictured, but it was far greater than I could imagine. Transformation is the act or process of changing completely. Transformation typically happens from the inside out. Now, I have the ability to transform other spaces but I would not have had that ability if I did not have the heart and my heart in the right place. The beautiful thing about a butterfly is that it can never return to its form as a caterpillar. Yes, the process is dark and sometimes it may seem lonely or even restricting, but you will never go back there if your heart is in the right place to receive your wings, your elevation, you stay lifted. I have a deeper meaning for what it means to be a promise or possibility. I have a greater respect for myself because I didn't realize how strong that I could be. I have a greater sense of empathy for others. The way that my journey unfolded allowed me to learn more about myself, find a deeper why, and it made me even more relentless in the pursuit of my dreams. Having a heart to succeed is not about the obstacles that you have to overcome, but how you decide to face those obstacles, reject the shame, and be the promise and the possibility that you were created to be. Is the condition of your heart ready for the race that you were called to run? So if ever in doubt or you can't seem to hear anything that tells you that you belong and that you are worthy of actualizing your dreams, remember, you are a promise. You are a possibility, you are a promise, with the capital P. You are a great big bundle of love, whatever you want to be. Go forth and actualize your dreams. <laughs> Trust your heart to succeed. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Deandra. Now onto our next speaker, Susan Torres, and her talk, Changing Your Intergenerational Story. Susan Torres is a native New Yorker, mother, teacher, mentor, and author. Her tenacious spirit and determination has inspired her to share her story of breaking free from the toxic family cycle that she was born into. Susan was featured in the New York Times, termed Single Mother Creative Miracles by Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Mike Weinrich. 
She is the recipient of several professional Toastmaster Annual Club Awards and the author of Living on Three Spoons, a chronicle of the lessons she learned and applied to inspire her life and her four children as a single parent. Throughout her career, Susan has taught and mentored children in New York City, New Jersey, Chicago, the United Arab Emirates, and New Delhi, India. She has dedicated her life to empowering youth, providing academic support to inner city children and homeless families, and mentoring parents caught in the crux of parenthood and life. Her vision is to teach women and youth that overcoming hardships is the difference between their fate and their destiny. When my youngest daughter was in elementary school, we moved from Brooklyn, New York to West Windsor, New Jersey, a small suburban town. That year she had an assignment, and that was to write about her life. So one day she came sprinting through the kitchen door, mom, mom, read it, read it. It was the assignment. She wrote about her favorite seasons, her future dreams, her peach colored room. Then came the part about her role model. I was getting ready to be flattered. This is what she wrote. My first role model is my mom. I would like to be like her because she divorced two times and raised four children all by herself. That is a very responsible woman. I almost swallowed my tongue. I was the new mom in town and this so-called sharing was making me feel very uncomfortable. It felt as if the Wizard of Oz just unveiled the curtain and I was standing there stark naked. But then I had to check myself because if she was okay with me, then I had to be okay with me. Still, I did think about it that evening. Was I promoting divorce? So here's my backstory. I was shaped by my mother, who was an alcoholic, and my stepdad, who was a drug addict. They were with each other for years, despite the fact that he abused her, verbally, emotionally, and physically. They were my role models. Now I wanna stop here and have you ask yourself, who were your role models growing up? Because according to the intergenerational transmission theory, parenting behavior is transmitted across generations. And if we think about the social learning theory that of course says children learn by role models, then are we all repeating our parents' behavior, just recycling what we learned for better or worse? I had to think about that myself because was my life fated to be like my mother's? So my life assignment was not to be like my mom. So I decided that I would change my future family story. But how do we change or how did I attempt to change my intergenerational story? One minor setback at a time. I invited destiny to partner with me. You see, I think destiny is different than fate. Fate is a one-way street and destiny. Destiny offers you the opportunities to make a right turn or a left turn. So in the words of Beethoven, I shall seize fate by the throat and it shall certainly never overcome me. When I was a teen, I decided that I was going to move my life chess pieces the way I wanted to move them. But when I was 16, my mother suffered a brain hemorrhage after an incident with my stepfather. And I visited her in the hospital. And as she lay there with half her face drooped down and the other side with a horseshoe shaped scar of stitches on her bald head, she said I needed to leave the home because I didn't get along with my stepdad. So that cut deep, but I moved on. And I went searching for love in all the wrong places and ways. Before long, I was in a teen love relationship. And before long, I was a teen mom. I had my first daughter at 18. I lived with their dad and we provided a nice, safe and happy home. Then I had another child at 21. Things were looking really good for me. But then cocaine entered the scene. You see, he started to use heavily. And for me, drugs were the enemy. So I threatened to leave if he didn't stop. But he had a solution, and that was to move to Puerto Rico where cocaine didn't exist. I naively agreed. So we packed our furniture and our things and we moved. Cocaine was alive and thriving in Bayamón, Puerto Rico. I fell into a pool of self-pity, 
But then one day, I walked into a general store where they sold everything from popcorn to handyman tools. And I saw a book rack, a metal book rack in the corner, you know, the kind that you can twirl around to see your options. And I noticed an English titled book. I bought it. Little did I know that that book would change the course of my life. I read it in two days, and I realized that the scenarios in that book mirrored my life. I was being held hostage by my mother's story and my past. And if fate had its way, I would be seduced by every unhealthy relationship, and so would my children. They would follow my path. So I decided at the cost of one life and to save three, I needed to leave. So with two children, $200 and two suitcases, I boarded a plane back to New York. When I arrived there, I stayed with my sister for about a month or two. I got a job as a receptionist. I found childcare and things were working out for me. I embraced a single parenthood. It would be six years before I decided to give marriage a try. The month my mother passed away, I met my soon-to-be husband. He was charming, he was comforting, so we started to date. We went on vacation together, I met his extended family, he met mine. Things were looking good. We had the same family values. And he didn't indulge in drugs or alcohol, so for me this was excellent. We got engaged, and before long, we got married. In the beginning, things were working out, but then he insisted that I learn more about his religion. You see, he was Jewish and I was Catholic, so I read a couple of books. Then he insisted on managing all the finances, even though I had a salary independent of his. I had worked my way up in the development field, even though I didn't have a college degree, and I was making pretty good money. Then I started to notice his short temper with the girls. That concerned me a little bit, but then I thought he's a step parent and it would take some time for him to make that adjustment. So we went for family counseling and we met with the religious leaders and things were getting better. Then I got pregnant with my son, my third child. At that point, he insisted that I convert and so I did. Then I schooled my two girls in the Jewish faith. And before you know it, we were one big, happy, orthodox family. Except his temper kept resurfacing. But he had a solution, and that was to move to Israel. You see, when a Jewish person moves to the Holy Land, that is considered Aliyah, which means to ascend upwards. So I thought that was a positive thing. So we packed our prayer books and our furniture, and we moved to Haifa, Israel. We settled in a nice Orthodox community neighborhood. One month later, a deliberate slap in my face would result in a bloodshot eye. I was in emotional shock for two reasons. One, that was the first time he ever did anything like that. And two, I just found out that I was pregnant with my fourth child. So I was in a dungeon of depression because I thought I betrayed my family. And another incident happened where he smacked my daughter's hand so hard that her pinky swelled. Now I really felt like I ruined my future family story. There was no book that I found to power me up that time. But I did find a support group for families who were dealing with issues that, like we were. And I snuck away every chance I could to keep myself aware of the situation. He traveled a lot that year, so he was hardly home, and he never struck me again or the kids. But the verbal and emotional abuse started to surface. So I gave birth to my daughter, my fourth child, and I was completely happy. But two weeks after I gave birth, my head would become a target of an item that he threw at me just because I said something he didn't like. That's when I knew I had to make a change. And I remembered a quote, the first time you're a victim, but the second time you're a volunteer. So I asked him if I could go to the States. My sister was getting married and I wanted to attend. He reluctantly let me go with the kids. I arrived in Brooklyn, New York. 
And on the phone, I let him know that I wasn't returning. And if we were going to fix our marriage and our problems, that it would be in the States. So he did come a couple of weeks later and we set ourselves up in a living arrangement. But two weeks later, we had an explosive fight and my intuition told me to leave. I called my sister, swallowed my pride and asked her if I can come and stay with her with my four kids. She agreed. It was the night before her wedding. So when I got there, she said, sure, you can stay for 10 days while I'm on my honeymoon. But when I get back, you need to go. I said, no problem. So I made a list and I said to myself, get a job, find a babysitter, find a place to live and find the finances to make it all happen. With each passing day, things fell into place. I found a job, I found a babysitter, I found a home. And then when it came to the finances, I used my fundraising skills and I contacted all my friends and asked them if they could loan me $100 each. And they said it was a donation, so that was in my favor. I orchestrated a new life in 10 days. From that setback, possibilities were born in my mind and I felt empowered. But the reality was I had a newborn, a toddler and two teens, and it was really hard being a working mom. So months passed by and then I decided to go back. Studies show that it takes at least seven times before a person leaves a volatile situation. But I had a condition. I let my then husband know that we needed to get therapy and we had to take it serious. And we did. So we all moved back together again. So it worked out for a couple of months until one day he came home from work before me and lashed out at my girls. And I came home to a scene. The therapist insisted that we work on it. I insisted on packing his bags. I didn't want to wait for anything to get any worse. We divorced a year later. Then I was again a new single mom and I looked around and we were living in this small apartment and I thought, no, this is not how it turns out. I want a house. So I started to save up for a down payment and within one year I bought a house. So I decided to go back to college. I went to school on the weekends and on the, in the evenings while I was working full time supporting my kids. And before long, I earned a bachelor's and a master's degree and I became a public school teacher. Two toddlers, two teens, two cats and two birds. I made it happen. So I'd like to end this talk with the better part of my setbacks. And that's the joy of parenting my four kids. Things weren't perfect after that, but they were pretty good. We had meals together every single night. And that one trip where I drove an RV from New York down to Florida almost did me in, but it was worth it. And our annual hike up Mohonk Mountain in New York taught us all perseverance, especially that time when my son's encouraging hand yanked me up the hardest part. And I knew I did my job when my eldest daughter at 26 tattooed on her back to thine own self be true. Yes, my four kids survived my single parenting from cradle to all college grads. And today they are pursuing their authentic selves. Alice Walker said it best. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking that they don't have any. I say, use your power, show up for your destiny and make brave choices after your setbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. What an inspirational story. Ladies and gentlemen, the first part of our program is now over. We will now start our 15 minute intermission. During intermission, we will have a special musical guest, Nisim Torres. Nisim is a guitarist, songwriter, and singer for the band Flowtone, a soulful rock group based in Chicago. Take it away, Nisim. When your love has gone away You must face yourself and you must say I remember better days Don't 
you cry cause she's gone she's only moving on chasing mirrors through Shake me down Not a lot of people left around Who knows now Softly laying on the ground Ooh. Not a lot of people left around Past, I've seen people walk into the sea just to find memories played by constant misery with eyes cast down, fixed upon the ground, eyes cast down. I'll keep my eyes fixed on the sun. Shake me down Cut my hair on a silver cloud Broken sound Softly laying on the ground Ooh. Not a lot of people left around Ooh. Ooh. In my past, bittersweet Found no love between the sheets Taste of blood, broken dreams Lonely times indeed, with eyes cast down, fixed upon the ground, eyes cast down. I'll keep my eyes fixed on the sun. Turn back, no, it's time for me to let go. Way down, how to find a place to lay low. Lampshade turn around into a light pose Walk around the corner Never saw it coming Still I try to make a move It almost stopped me from believing I don't want to know the future I'm like rolling thunder Even on a cloudy day 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 Ten decisions shape your life You'll be aware of five about Seven ways to go through school You're either noticed or left out Seven ways to get ahead Seven reasons to drop out When I say can see me in your eyes you said I can see you in my head that's the 
That's not just friendship, that's romance too. You like music, we can dance to. Sit me down, shout me up, I'll calm down. I'll get along with you. There comes a time where we all fail. Take it pretty well. So they take it out all on themselves. Others they take it out on friends. Yeah, everybody plays the game. And if you don't, you're called insane. Don't, 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 don't. It's not safe no more. Got to see you on. That's when you were born in 1984. Sit me down, shut me out. I'll calm down. And I'll get along with you. I just want to take a moment to thank. TEDx Rush U for having me during this intermission. And at this point, I'd like to play an original by my band, Flowtone. The song is called Hold. <laughs> up suitcase and you're leaving swear you'll never fold even if it takes you years I know it's hard to hold on I believe you'll make it still and you know you can breathe easy all you have to do is hold your soul on we'll make this place ours Sins on the run, reeling in the expectations. Plenty left to grow, and some it's written on our faces. Where does this story end? How long will I be in this place? Don't get caught on questions, even if they make you scared, cause you know you can breathe. All you have to do is hold your soul on We'll make this place our home And you know you can breathe easy All you have to do is hold your soul on We'll make this place our home Breathe.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming the first speaker for the second part of our program, Erica Battle, and her talk titled, Own Your Story, How Disappointments and Rejection Help Fuel Your Success. Erica Battle is a thought partner to leaders in education, offering strategies of impact propelling communities forward. The author of Who You Are, a guide to help adolescents navigate through the social and emotional issues of life, she understands that the growth of schools, communities, cities, and nations begin with one person that becomes radically aware of who they are. She is a conversational, witty, and gritty leader who transforms big picture problems into solution-focused action items for implementation in the real world. Erica understands that the challenges that schools face are both unique and yet familiar, and she pushes educators to examine their own bias and stereotypes that may be stifling positive outcomes. She utilizes discussions of equity, trauma, enforced practices, and academic data chats to build a blueprint for sustainable success. A featured speaker both nationally and internationally, Erica encourages all to make bold moves by evaluating the now while acting to impact their next. Own your story. If I were to tell you to own your story, would you truly understand what is meant by that phrase? Owning your story means that you acknowledge the good times, the not so good times, and the times in between, recognizing that they all played an important role in your story. See, most of us make a conscious decision to skip over the times of adversity, disappointment, failures, and feelings of rejection because we major in the minor and we are embarrassed to acknowledge those not so good moments, not really understanding that those moments too play such an important part of our story. So now it's time to cue the participation trophy ceremony for just showing up for field day and not winning a single event. I mean, I know what you're saying, that that trophy would be the only recognition that some students would receive. And I totally get it. There are moments when the participation trophy is totally appropriate. But there are also times where we must truly recognize the effort given and not just because a person showed up. See, what message are we sending? that you can show up, put in little effort, and you'll still be recognized. I honestly believe that because of that participation trophy ceremony, that it is so hard for some people to process disappointments, failures, times of adversity, and times when they have felt rejected. See, I remember when I was in the fourth grade and I would practice for field day all year long in PE, especially if I didn't win a ribbon in the top three places the year before. Oh, I was running around looking like a wild child all year long. That really didn't matter to me though. As long as when field day was over, I got on the school bus with my ribbons because I placed in the top three, me running around looking like a wild child meant nothing because that was the moment that I had been preparing for. Now, again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't recognize effort, but while we're recognizing effort, we should also be able to reflect upon why we didn't win in the first place. Believe me, I know what it's like to want to skip over failures, disappointments, and times that our, our ideas were rejected in order to just talk about my wins. It's kind of like, who wants to hear about those times you felt disappointed or rejected? I'm here to tell you everyone, everyone wants to hear about those times because see, they need to know that beyond your failures and your disappointments and the times that you felt rejected is their own personal version of success as long as they don't give up. 
When I'm asked, Erica, how did you begin educational consulting? I am happy to talk about the book that I wrote, Who Are You? A Guide to Help Adolescents Navigate Through the Social and Emotional Issues of Life. I will gl gladly talk about how that book helped me carve out a place in educational consulting. Or I'll happily talk about when I began to present at conferences and make connections and just began to get the opportunity to network and do small consulting jobs. Or I may even mention the time that I took a chance, emailed a well-known author, and he helped me make the right connections to truly get my career started. I'll happily talk about those times because see, those are some of my wins. But the times that I don't really wanna talk about is the time that one spring day, my administrator called me into her office. She engaged me in a few pleasantries before she was telling me that I was being displaced. And for my non-teacher friends, being displaced means I was no longer needed or wanted at her school for the upcoming school year. Talk about feeling disappointed, talk about feeling like a failure and rejected all in one moment, especially since the year before our local news came and did a story on me in that same school highlighting high student achievement. Or should I talk about the time I was hired to be the director of literacy, but I really wasn't allowed to really function fully in my job because I had more experience than the leadership and the leadership didn't want me to outshine them. So basically I was kind of shunned and not allowed to function at my fullest capacity. Or I could tell you about the countless number of friends who stopped answering my phone call once I began to see some success in educational consulting. And the crazy part about that is these were a lot of the same friends who were encouraging me to leave the traditional classroom setting and begin to consult. I've always wondered, so were they betting on my success or were they betting on my failure? See, it's those moments, those moments when we feel uncomfortable, those moments when we are disappointed, those moments when we feel rejected that truly fuels our success. It's in those uncomfortable moments that we really begin to grow. See, most of us would be happy with just staying within our comfort zone, things that are stable, because we know what to expect from day to day. But I'm here to challenge you. It's in those uncomfortable moments that we truly find our greatness if we don't give up. So I figured I would give you a four-step process on how we can ace our feelings of disappointment, failures, and rejection. So the first thing I want you to do is to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge the times that we're disappoint disappointed, the times that we feel rejected, the times that we are going through adversity. We must truly acknowledge how those moments are making us feel. Because a lot of times we take those moments and we kind of push them in the back burner and then we're triggered and those moments come back up and we have no clue on what to do with them because we never acknowledged them in the first place and figured out what to do with the feelings. Well, after you acknowledge the feelings, I then want you to compartmentalize. Where do those feelings go? See, we need to take a lesson from the best salespeople, right? The highest paid salespeople have learned the art of compartmentalizing their feelings. What they want to do is get to the no 
quick because if they get to the no, they know on the other side of a no is a yes. And what they don't do is take the no personally. What they realize is that when people tell them no, they're not rejecting the salesperson, they're rejecting the offer. So we need to be like salespeople. We need to compartmentalize our disappointments, our failures, and our feelings of rejection. The next thing we need to do is evaluate. What should we do next? Hmm, should we change the offer? Should we change our environment? What is it? What's next? What should we do next? Should we try to do something else? I don't know what that what next is for you, but we should evaluate what is the next thing that we should do. And finally, we need to do the next thing. See, we allow our failures, our disappointments, and feelings of rejection to get us stuck, you know? It's kind of like it takes a hold of us and it won't let it, you know, it won't let us go until we take the time to deal with it head on. So once you have acknowledged how you felt about it, compartmentalized the, the feeling, evaluated what needs to happen next, you have to do the next thing and not get stagnant because of a failure, a disappointment, or a rejection. And after you've done all of that, you can look those moments in the face and tell them, I've aced you once and I can ace you again. I challenge you to acknowledge those good times, those bad times, and those in-between times, and recognize that every moment has played an important part of your story. Own your story. Thank you. Wow, Erica, what an inspiring talk. Thank you. Our next speaker, will be Dr. Konstantin E. Kanakis and his talk titled, An MD with MD. Konstantin is a Chicago native and a resident physician at Loyola University Medical Center's Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. He is Rush University Graduate College of Health Sciences alum and a board certified medical laboratory scientist. He is a published writer, patient advocate, and physician scientist. With a career focused on hematopathology, transfusion medicine, and public health and equity, he has received recognition internationally for his efforts to combat Zika virus in the Caribbean and for being an early voice for accurate, equitable, and reliable COVID-19 testing in the U.S. From the American Society for Clinical Pathology, he is a 2017 Top 40 Under 40 Award, was named to the 2020 Global Pathologist Power List, and sits on several committees with ASCP, including the Commission for Continuing Education, the Social Media Committee, and Patient Champions Committee. His other committee appointments include the American Association of Blood Blanks Education and Accreditation Committee and the Greater Chicagoland Area American Red Cross Auxiliary Board. A TEDx alum, he delivered a 2019 talk about the incredible changes to medical education and practice called unrecognizable medicine. As an experienced public speaker, patient advocate, and laboratory medicine educator, Dr. Kanakis hopes to break down interdisciplinary barriers in medicine, crush stereotypes, and renormalize compassion in new ways. From the bench to the bedside, laboratory medicine provides a unique perspective on communication, education, and what it really means to be an advocate. Everyone experiences setbacks, failures, mix-ups, false steps, and delays whatever you want to call them, in whatever context you can think of, they're a universal truth to simply being human. When you scroll through your social media feeds, you'll often see motivational posts or screen grabs with memes and lines that say things like, no pain, no gain, or fall down 10 times, get up 11. They're all great and true, but I often feel like they're just too short to express what it means to have a setback, what it feels like to be pushed backwards on your way to a goal. So in that spirit, let me share three stories with you that summarize one of my life's biggest setbacks and what adjusting, adapting, and thriving look like, at least for me. 
I had the chance to do medical school abroad for a multitude of reasons, some of which included its own list of setbacks and challenges, but not related to this story. I was so happy to begin this chapter, and as a bonus honeymoon, my wife and I flew down to St. Martin in December of 2015 before I started school in January. A few months in, everything was fantastic. I was adjusting to life on a beautiful Caribbean island, soaking up culture and medical knowledge, and we were happy. Happy enough to endure the mosquito's gift of Zika virus to us both. Ironically, and as a sort of retaliation against the mosquitoes, we both later started local public health research and campaigns on the topic, but that's another story. After a few days off with fever and a rash, things returned to normal. I was back to class, and my infinite cycle of sleep, study, and sun continued. Until it didn't. One morning, I woke up early, as I often did, to have coffee and watch the boats go out in the lagoon from our patio. But instead of breakfast, I ate some tile. I fell into the closet next to our bed, the floor after that, the wall after that, and stumbled my way to our bathroom as the world violently spun around me at 6 a.m., and me catching my breath in between puking and flushing my way through the morning. My hearing was absolutely gone. My wife shouted at me, but it was like a bomb went off, and I heard nothing but piercing, shrill noise. It lasted for hours. When things slightly settled and I was able to muster an assisted standing position, my wife helped me back to the bed awkwardly. I was propped up at 40-something degrees, trash bin in close proximity. With heavy eyelids, we agreed that I needed to go to the doctor. Doctor? I'm almost one of those. Could I figure this out? I felt drunk. Did I sleep drink more beer than I could handle? Doubtful. Did I have a brain tumor? Too scary. Stroke? Still scary. I didn't know enough, and I couldn't stay awake enough to solve this myself. I slept through the rest of the night, afternoon, and through the next day, completely undisturbed, until the next morning. A slightly lower angle of pillows, I cautiously stepped down to the floor and got dressed. We headed to the closest doctor's office, and he didn't seem to have any answers. He asked questions about my sleep habits, my stress. My episode was isolated, and he noticed I was a tad congested, so he talked it up to sinus pressure and said I needed some more vitamin C, as in the Caribbean C. I laughed, I said thank you, but my laughing stopped at the door. We sulked and went back home. Since that awful morning, I had gotten a little dizzy and had a few spells of hearing uh, loss in my ears, but nothing special. I thought I might have been overheated or dehydrated. So would you, the Caribbean summer's hot. But months later, at a Zika prevention and education event, it happened again. This time in broad daylight, with friends and colleagues surrounding me, and right after I was on local television. My wife promptly delivered me back to bed, while it felt like she was taking nothing but roundabouts home. Was I okay? Was I slowly dying? Would I have another attack? They come on so strong and fast. Would it happen during an exam? Would somebody think I was cheating on a test? Would it happen at the beach? At the bar? On stairs? Would I get hurt? How do I prevent this? Same deal. Next morning, we went back to the same clinic. This time, a younger local doctor and friend was covering. He listened and asked different sets of questions. It was the first time I heard anybody mutter the thought, maybe it's Veneer's disease. Great, I had a name, a diagnosis, a possible answer. And it was something that was coming up in neurology class next week. Perfect. He wrote me a prescription for some steroid pills for a week just to give my ears and balance centers a break. When Meniere's disease came up in class, it confused me more. It's often something called a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning there are about a hundred other things that it could be that need to be ruled out first. Before doctors shrug and say, maybe it's that. As a syndrome, the cause of Meniere's is poorly understood. And the only consensus I could find in any textbooks, literature, or conversations with other doctors was that it's incurable. Damn, I didn't want that. Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was just something that looks like Meniere's. I can't have an incurable chronic illness. I'm 29. I was referred by the last clinic appointment for further testing to look at my eardrums and have nerve functions testing done. This was my greatest lesson in bedside manner. That specialist asked probing questions and had strong opinions about my stress level exposure to cigarettes and alcohol, and my non-existent cocaine problem, and the burden of being married. I got mad, she cried. So I've got a second opinion, obviously. After a few referrals from friends and locals, I met with one other doctor. I'm in a half French country with a diagnosis named after a French physician. Let's go see a French doctor. A few tests later, he talked to us both about how Meniere's might possibly be connected to cervical misalignment. I was fleetingly hopeful. He gave me a book to read, and so began a long journey of sifting through anecdotal evidence from sparse literature on treatments and medications. With a lack of any reliable information on this, I was lost, literally at sea. A giant knowledge gap was decreasing, but I was catching up to a decades-old gap in Meniere's knowledge. 
I vowed to try to be healthier, minimize triggers, decrease salt, maximize water intake, cut alcohol and caffeine as best I could, and manage the stress and hold on to the hope that I would find more answers back home. Clinicals. The second half of medical school is a literal crash course in doctoring. After passing what feels like some impossible exams, you're granted clearance to be the helpful short white coat amidst all the grown-up doctors in the hospital. You see patients, you write notes, and you do exams and procedures. It's as exhilarating as it is rewarding. The hours are longer and the educational content is immeasurable. The pace is exponential. What better place than to have picked to spend my second half of med school than New York City, the city that never sleeps for the medical trainees that rarely do. My episodes had relaxed a bit. I was left with occasional fullness in one ear or another. It would come and go, but it would never last a week. Besides the episodes of dizziness and hearing ups and downs, I now had permanent unwavering tinnitus that never left. I have not heard actual silence since 2016, and it ranges from annoying to infuriating. But the Big Apple taught me something else to learn about besides medicine and tinnitus, and my biggest Meniere's trigger of all, weather. New York experiences drastic weather changes and subtropical fronts that hit and run. It's made me very happy to have departed our island home a week before the devastation of Hurricane Irma in 2017, since barometric pressure changes are my new kryptonite. Like my disease in a quote a favorite movie, the weather patterns come on you fast and they leave you fast. Excellent. Another thing I can't control about a diagnosis I know little about. Maybe I should seek out a doctor here in Manhattan. Certainly there are some renowned specialists that might have deeper insights. My wife, a doctorate level nurse and now an amateur climatologist, was running thin on patients for things she had less control of to, over to protect me. It was hard to find the time to make doctor's appointments when A, I couldn't take too long off clinical rotations, and B, I couldn't hear well enough on the phone to make my own appointments. So the months went by with managing symptoms and rain-related headaches and hearing fluctuations and explanations for my brain fog and new clinical preceptors every few weeks. It was exhausting. It was lunchtime one day and raining out after a long clinic day when the spin started again. I traced a wall back to the elevators and made it up to the student lounge where I fell towards a bathroom. I recognized another student and asked him to help me. Help me how? I, I didn't know. The only thing I could mutter was emergency room, please. So we hobbled downstairs together. There I somehow managed to explain what was happening and they took me in as a patient with my white coat and stethoscope hanging on the IV pole behind me. They gave me enough fluids and sedatives to relax my way through the worst of it. I only woke up a few times during my naps to see my best friend in medical school checking in on me in the afternoon and later my wife when there was a lot less window light than I remember on the start of the adventure. Having been told that I vomited too much to be let go, I haphazardly offered my neighbor help with his EKG and other things I didn't remember. My wife convinced me that we should go home. I agreed. You can imagine we had the same conversation. Time to see somebody. So we made the appointment. This time the doctor was young, only a touch older than me, and happy to go over the ins and outs of modern recommendations for those with Meniere's disease. How I would have to allocate serious recovery time after every major episode, or that simply having an episode means I'm experiencing actual irreversible damage to my hearing. Goals include preventing these attacks at all costs now. He said his clinic had several, and even though it sucks as a disease, there's some helpful medication out there. I was happy and devastated. We were thrilled to have a comprehensive help and mortified that I might have to deal with this forever. Would I lose my hearing? Could I beat this? Could I finish medical school? Can I safely take the subway? I started a process of carrying emergency medications with me in a collapsible cane, knowing that I could get worse or better at a whim's notice. After the first visit came another specialist for confirmatory testing of my vision, balance, and hearing, all of which proved by burden of required proof that I indeed had bilateral Meniere's disease. With the now official name of my nemesis, I began to collect more information on others' experiences with medications, treatments, and disease progression. I joined online support groups, discussion forums, professional societies, whatever I could, and wrote pieces about my experience to connect with others about this miserable ailment, all while learning for, caring for, and treating patients in medical school. What was shameful and embarrassing explanation cycles became important discussions about expectations. Men students were the lowest rung on the ladder, the least of which gets any concession in the culture of medical training. What happens if I get attacked with a scalpel in my hand during a delivery or when I'm helping out in a code? Was I more of a liability than an asset at this point? I was learning how to balance both myself on my feet and professionally. I learned a lot about boundary setting and self-care. I learned a lot about weather, mostly from my wife. Like most other things in life, clinicals and medical school came to an end. I graduated. I was officially an MD, 
Life goal achieved, but now came the hard part. Apply to and interview for residency training in a daunting computer algorithm driven process Trainee applicants from all over the world and country apply for fewer spots than can be filled in programs at hospitals large and small. I began my own campaign trail on multiple states across multiple time zones, experiencing hearing related troubles the entire time. I newly employed the services of a crappy off-brand hearing amplifier in one year, but that was with its own trouble. It was bulky, the hearing was distorted, and sometimes there was a lot of feedback. The battery would die one time mid-interview. Regardless, I made it through, and I matched to my number one program here in Chicago. I was set to start my formal specialty training. I received my official paperwork in the spring and signed on to start in July of 2020. Along that roller coaster of challenges, both emotional and physical, my match cycle had ended at the peak of surging cases of COVID-19 in New York City, a few months before the rest of the country had its own peak. I found another specialist ahead of that time, this time in Chicago, and set to meet with them after my move. When moving day came, we set off in our U-Haul from one peak to another. As we drove west, the cloud of mask wearing and lockdowns followed us. New apartment, new job, new hospital, all very exciting. By July, I was eager starting fresh and all day mask wearing was new for me. I had only worked, studied and interviewed in a pre-pandemic world, but I was very happy to wear one in the context. A few weeks into residency, I noticed the problem. I was starting to lose my hearing again. No big deal, I've been there before. I dusted off my old screechy amplifier just in case I needed help and set off to work. My hearing would be back in about a week or so, right? Besides, Chicago's weather, way better than anything on the East Coast, but that's my personal biased opinion. Small problem again, hearing never came back. My hearing stayed super low and I was using old screechy more than ever before. I was flying through batteries, this was a problem practice of any kind of medicine is predicated on the interpersonal communications between physicians and others. How could I do that if I couldn't hear anyone? Were I not, my specialist appointment finally came with its own battery of Meniere's balance and hearing tests. Good news, my balance was doing all right. Somewhat bad news, my hearing had decreased. Shoot, what do I do? Is this little difference in hearing enough to ruin my experience? What had changed? It turns out when people took their masks off at lunch, I could hear just fine. I discovered I was a talented lip reader. How long was I lip reading? Had I adapted? Had I been missing things in previous conversations? Absolutely. But that doesn't matter now. What do I do with my decreasing hearing in a mask wearing world? After a few trips back and forth to the audiologist and more hearing loss, the answer was complicated. I had reached the end of the algorithmic treatment of Meniere's disease. Surgeries are 50-50 aiming at the decompression of little sacs in the ear that overfill with fluid. Medications are helpful, but not a cure-all. Avoiding triggers and managing symptoms are the best, but what's the management for hearing loss if no medication has ever been shown to help with that? I had endured a few trips to the special ENT to get steroids injected directly into my ears past the eardrum. That is no fun. And it helped for a few days, but every time I went, my hearing went back down afterwards. You don't know self-doubt until you take a formal hearing test in a soundproof booth, listening to words over headphones that decrease and increase in volume and clarity. The familiar multi-tonal ringing in my ears had evolved into this throbbing loud scream that isn't just annoying, but interferes with whatever I'm hearing. I often have to ask people to repeat themselves, not because I can't hear them, but because I can't hear them over the combination of a freight train, a tea kettle, and an air horn that's inside my head. Medications do nothing for tinnitus, and it's all coping strategies. Finally, my new doctor asked if I tried hearing aids. Hearing aids? Me? A 30-something new minted doc with a cane, some white hair, and now hearing aids? Great. I'm in my first year of residency training, and I look like someone in their first year of retirement. So with the graceful understanding of my department and multiple appointments for ear shots and tests, I had a session to get hearing aids. In my fitting, I remember looking at the brochure to pick out a color for the receivers. Should I get brown to match most of my hair, or white to match the direction I'm heading? When they finally came, I put them on. The audiologist turned them on and wow, I heard her breathing. It was a big box store, so I heard a cash register. I heard some kid crying. I heard traffic outside. I was beyond amazed. My wife cried, I heard her. It was like the first time I got prescription glasses when I was 10. The entire drive home, I was counting the leaves on the trees instead of the green blobs I thought they were. It took, and it is still taking getting used to. I still have good hearing days and bad hearing days but the hearing aids must have given my inner ears some peace because they help with balance too. My ears are less tired, there's less straining, and less struggling to participate. 
Masks still completely obliterate any semblance of clarity I have. Unlike prescription glasses, hearing aids only comprehensively amplify sounds. They don't make things clearer. Even still, that's a win for me now. After getting back to Chicago, I struggled to hear my friends, my family, my new colleagues, but now I got some fancy tech that helps a lot. Major setback, small comeback. So why do you care if I can hear or stand or walk or anything? When something's wrong, we go to the doctor. You expect them to have all the answers or at least know where to find them. This entire journey is one of not having answers or explanations or even a good plan. It's been a mess and so have I. If my stories leave you with anything besides lessons on mosquito prevention, coastal climates, and lip reading, I want it to be two things. First, every single person you meet is holding some invisible weight that you can't understand. A chronic illness, mental health issues, life troubles, or more. You've heard the phrase, we're all in the same boat. Let me add another. Instead, we're all in the same storm, in different boats. Some yachts, some dinghies, some makeshift rafts. And I'm not a great swimmer. We have to remember to extend compassion to people, to give each other space for our struggles that are visible or invisible, and give each other respect for what we're all individually working towards. We've got to protect the potential for others to grow. From helping people directly to now wearing masks, compassion is the best foundation for addressing setbacks. And point number two, remember that doctors are just people too. For all the patients and families a physician might see, test, and treat, they're part of a family of their own possibly and probably with their own invisible setbacks and burdens you'll never know about. In the face of the last few years of burnout and isolation, remembering our humanity is the key to any shared recovery together. I'm just one example, and I hope we get the chance to make our own comebacks together. Thank you for sharing your story, Constantine. Now for our next presenter of the evening, Dr. Ashley Bryant and her talk, Gains and Loss. With over a decade of experience working as a psychotherapist, Dr. Ashley Bryant has worked with several individuals to help them navigate grief, trauma, and other mental health challenges. Dr. Bryant has also served many years as a rehabilitation counselor, where she worked with individuals with disabilities to help them identify and eliminate employment barriers. Dr. Bryant now uses her experiences in mental health and disability services to help organizations promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and mental wellness in the workplace. Through keynote speaking and consulting, Dr. Bryant facilitates transformative experiences for leaders and organizations seeking to make sustainable impact. Dr. Bryant has been featured nationally on TLC's My 600 Pound Life, NPR, Black News Channel, and on many local news stations across the country. Dr. Bryant is an HBCU alum who received a Master of Science in Rehabilitation Counseling from Langston University in Langston, Oklahoma. She is also a proud graduate of Oklahoma State University, where she received a Doctor of Philosophy in Workforce and Adult Education. Dr. Bryant is married to her wonderful husband, BJ, and is the dog mom to one fur baby named Tulip. Everyone has that year that year that stands out in their minds. For me, it was the year of my 17th birthday. I recall spending most of that summer day writing. I wish it had been for a school paper. Words just seem to flow better when I know I'm being graded. But this was no school paper and there are no grades given when writing your mom's obituary. You see a day reserved for birthday gifts and yellow cake with chocolate frosting had turned into a day of insurmountable grief. For me, 2003 was that year. For many individuals across the globe, 2020, was that year. Lives were lost, weddings were postponed, and graduations were canceled. And while it may seem like 2020 was a year in which everything was lost, just like I overcame the challenges of 2003, we all can overcome the challenges of 2020. 
There's an old Buddhist proverb that says, in each loss, there is a gain. As in every gain, there is a loss. And with each ending comes a new beginning. So in this talk, we'll take a journey to understanding how we can begin to find the gains in losing. I remember a couple of years ago, I had just moved my therapy practice into a new building. I was really excited about this newer and larger space. But within a matter of days, a pipe, bless, a pipe burst flooding the office and ruining a lot of the new decor that had touched the floor. I got this call while I was at church and I remember explaining to a lady what happened. And I recall her response to me. She said, you know what? This is just a setup for a comeback. It was in that very moment that I knew this lady had completely lost her mind. Sure enough, all of those things could be replaced. But tell that to my bank account that was just hit with all of the charges associated with decorating a comfortable but also oh stylish office space. You see, the thing about loss is we spend a lot of time seeking to gain while actively avoiding the pain that comes along with loss. And the science of loss aversion says that when we lose, the pain of loss is twice as intense as the pleasure of gain. So essentially, it is better for us to avoid losing $100 than it is to find $100. It is this perspective regarding loss that hinders us from seeing any gains that may be tucked away in our losses. And dare I say that some losses may actually be gateways to gains. You see, I've spent many years as a mental health therapist over a decade to be exact. And part of my work consisted of helping individuals overcome losses that in the moment feels like a slow sink beneath a pool of quicksand. But by navigating my own challenges and helping others do the same, I have created an action-based framework that teaches individuals how to act when faced with a loss, a challenge, or any other setback. ACT is an acronym for Accept, Challenge, and Transform. Acceptance is the preliminary step to processing the reality of a loss or a setback. When we are presented with setbacks, we have to understand that we cannot control the things that happen in our lives. Now, there may be this tendency to avoid dealing with the reality of painful challenges. But the fact is, avoidance is a temporary solution that doesn't garner long-term results. Acceptance is the acknowledgement of things as they are. So whether you are dealing with the loss of a loved one, a breakup, or loss of a job, acceptance may come with an uncomfortable array of emotions. And that's okay because those emotions are only temporary. Acceptance requires us to engage in this difficult task of sitting in that pain. That means allowing yourself to feel all of the feelings that arise versus trying to push them away. In doing so, we experience less pain in the long run. There's a small part of the brain structure known as the limbic system. This very powerful system is responsible for regulating our emotions. And we can blame the system from, for taking our emotions from zero to 100 real quick or putting us in a fight or flight response. But the limbic system can be regulated when we choose not to ignore our feelings. Pushing those emotions away 
will only cause them to explode like a shaken soda bottle under pressure. To help you move towards acceptance, consider imagining a friend or loved one experiencing the same or similar situation. How would you respond and what advice would you give them? Now take that same advice and apply it to your situation. The next part of the ACT framework is challenge. Overcoming setbacks involves challenging how we view the setbacks. When you have a setback, it's very easy to start down this negative thinking pattern that says, I'm a failure, or I just can't seem to get it together. Don't go down that rabbit hole. Succumbing to this identity as a failure becomes a self-fulfilled prophecy. There's a common quote by Henry Ford that says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Today's failure is not tomorrow's story. So just because you fail today doesn't mean you are destined to fail tomorrow or any day after that. This setback is only temporary. You see, there's a difference between a setback and a roadblock. The thing about setbacks is they are designed to slow you down. They delay your arrival to your destination. But if you're patient enough, you still get there. But roadblocks, roadblocks are like tar paper that keep us stuck. Roadblocks keep us from moving forward. But when we challenge how we view setbacks, it keeps us from misappropriating any temporary setback as a permanent roadblock. The way we challenge the perception of those setbacks is to develop a plan that eliminates failure as an option. You see, when I play a game of cards, I can't play cards that aren't in my hand. And spoiler alert, you can't play the failure card if it isn't even in the deck. I realize that I'm asking you to challenge your mentality and your perception, and that can be a very difficult task. But to begin the process of challenging your perception around setbacks, you have to keep moving. Newton's law of motion says an object in motion stays in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. So you see, it's easier to remain in motion than it is to get in motion. Once you have accepted the reality of setbacks and challenged unhelpful thought processes, you are ready to embark on the final part of the ACT framework, and that is transform. If you can for a minute, think about those cool transformer toys that we had as kids. They started off as one toy and completely morphed into a totally different toy. So imagine your setbacks starting off as one thing and completely transforming into another thing. Or dare I say, a setback morphing into a comeback. Transformations happen when we look at setbacks as mere inconveniences and you begin to create the life that you desire. During this transformation phase, you have to develop a strategic plan that outlines where you are, where you want to be, and what steps you need to take to get there. As you begin to transform, take some time to reflect on what you've learned from the setback. And remember that failure isn't always a bad thing. Failure typically provides an opportunity for us to learn. And this journey to success may come with many setbacks, but you have the power to use those setbacks to propel you forward. Transformation does not require perfection. And seeking perfection can lead you down this path of procrastination. If you seek perfection, you may find yourself inclined to delay getting started because you fear not getting everything just right. If that's the case, start small. 
Don't try to do everything at once, but do something. Make it a goal to do one to two things every day. Keep track of your progress and reward yourself as you begin to see transformations happen. So 2020 was a heck of a year. It was devastating. It was prosperous. It was exhausting. It was rejuvenating. It was divisive. It was uniting. It was a year of setbacks. It was a year of comebacks. It was a year of gains. It was a year of loss. I challenge you to encounter every setback with looking for the gains in losing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Ashley. Now for our final presenter of the evening, please welcome Latoya Jackson and her talk titled The Entrepreneur Journey, The Comeback is Greater Than the Setbacks. Latoya Jackson, originally from Cleveland, Ohio, graduated from The Ohio State University in 2004 with a BS in Business Administration and a concentration in Marketing. With her marketing experience, she brings 16 years of business-to-business -business sales with Fortune 500 companies such as Philip Morris and Michelin Tire Company. In addition, her experience in the real estate industry included $1.4 million in real estate sales. After relocating to Chicago, Latoya began to invest in real estate to include fix and flips, rentals, mixed-use commercial, wholesale deals, and Airbnb. It was at this time that she realized the need to secure funding. This journey then led to the emergence of Excel Capital Group. Latoya is the founder and CEO of Excel Capital Group, which provides business credit and funding solutions for entrepreneurs looking for capital to start, grow, and scale their business. Take it away, Latoya. So often when I say my name is Latoya Jackson, I feel the urge to instantly add but not Michael Jackson's little sister. Celebrity names carry a lot of weight and possibly at my birth, my seeds for success were subconsciously planted. I was informed that my mom let my sister name me. And she said that Latoya Jackson was in the spotlight during the era in which I was born. But as time went on, perhaps I should have been named after Janet. <laughs> I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio by a single mother. My father died from cancer when I was only two years old. However, he was a Vietnam War veteran. He was a college graduate and he taught at Kirk Middle School in East Cleveland, Ohio. My mother, not ma, mommy or mom, is how I address the woman who birthed me. She was born and raised in a farm in Georgia and she was the daughter of sharecroppers, basically picking cotton most of her life. Uh, she did graduate from high school and she worked various jobs to support me and my sister. And at some point she attended barber school. I grew up very poor, you know, but as a child, you only know the environment in which you live in. And so I'm not sure what age I realized I was poor. However, I always knew that I wanted a better life for myself. I remember my mother saying to me, Toya, I want you to dream big and I want you to experience more than me. As a kid, I didn't really know what that means. Throughout the years, it has taken on several meanings. I'm a proud graduate of Shaw High School in East Cleveland, Ohio. And there I had a dual career path. I was a vocational student, now known as career and technical education. And I was also on the college track as well. So I had the best of both worlds as an academic foundation. I pictured myself being this fly hair stylist who was well-educated too. But the crazy thought is I often thought I could do it all and be it all. Remembering back to my mind when my mother has said that to me, I'm the second person in my family to get a college degree. I graduated from the Ohio State University in 2004 with a BS in business administration. My major was marketing. 
when I was in college, someone gave me the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, which inspired me to learn more about real estate. You know, I didn't have any real estate investors or entrepreneurs in my family, so I was never exposed to any of this information. But I knew that one day that I would invest in real estate, but I had no idea how I would do that as a broke college student. So that was a dream deferred. So after graduating college, I worked for two Fortune 500 companies for Philip Morris, as well as Michelin Tire Company. And I was an outside sales representative for both companies. Michelin is the company that relocated me from Ohio to the DC market and later to Chicago, where I currently live today. I have over 15 years of business to business sales experience. And in addition to that sales job, I received my real estate license when I lived in DC. And while working there with Long and Foster Realtors, I would work with a lot of investors. And when I worked with these investors, they allowed me to gain so much knowledge in the field of real estate. You know, they would tell me, you know, how much they wanted to purchase the property for, how much they wanted to put into the rehab. And they would also tell me how they wanted to fund the deal. And at closing, they would profit $50,000 or more. And I was not excited to leave the, the closing table with a $5,000 commission that I had to split with my broker. So it was at this time that I realized that I didn't really want to be a real estate agent anymore. Instead, the title of investor is what caught my attention. So soon after that in DC, my job offered me a promotion and I was relocated to Chicago. And once I moved to Chicago, I continued to work my plan to become a full-time real estate investor while working my nine to five. I attended a lot of workshops, a lot of seminars. I read a lot of books on real estate. I even joined a local group of real estate investors. And at this time, I created a plan to exit my job, which included eliminating all of my debt. I wanted to purchase a three unit property, my first property with FHA financing. I wanted my tenants to pay my rent, right? Which would eliminate my mortgage payment. I also purchased a car cash so I wouldn't have a car note. And I had 12 months worth of savings so that if my business was not profitable, I could still pay my bills. In addition to that, I contributed the maximum amount to my 401k. And the last part of my plan was to purchase two multifamily properties to replace my income from my job. I completed everything on my list except the last one. And I was so anxious that I quit my job earlier than I had expected, which proved to be a major mistake. So in 2016, I left my full-time six-figure job and started my business with my partners. And in the beginning of my entrepreneurship journey, I was filled with hope, hope, drive, ambition. I thought we were going to be rich. I thought me and my business partners, we would take over the real estate market here in Chicago. And we raised over $2 million within a five-year period to do various types of real estate projects. So that includes fix and flips, buy and holds, mixed use commercial, wholesale deals. And we also had some Airbnb properties. I learned so much about funding and fundraising in my first business. I experienced a lot of success, but also a lot of failures. So fast forward to now. Five years later, I battled a magnitude of minor setbacks. I lost everything. My home was going into foreclosure. My car was repossessed. My credit was ruined. And as a result, I had to file for bankruptcy. In essence, I really was at the lowest point in my life and no one knew. And I asked myself, how did I get here? So after this whole ordeal, I never imagined that I would entertain the thought of starting another business after losing almost everything. In my opinion, my dream of entrepreneurship was over. I had to return to corporate America after bragging about leaving. And what I realized is that corporate America was not for me. 
the common advice of go to school, get good grades, get a good job, that no longer resonated with me and many others. There are so many opportunities that we have available now that our parents and our ancestors could have never dreamed of. You no longer must stay in a dead end job working 40 hours a week for a low salary or go back to school only to make more money and to be placed in a higher tax bracket so you may make less. Uh, due to the technology and social media, you no longer have to settle for the rat race. You can start a business or you can build some passive income or you could do both. Through it all, I've experienced the good times and the bad and the ugly. And, and therefore, I've learned lessons the hard way. So here are some of the lessons that I learned along the way that I wanna pass along to you. So first, according to the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, approximately 20% of small businesses fail within the first year. By the end of the second year, 30% of businesses have failed. And by the end of the fifth year, about half will have failed. And unfortunately, that was the case in our first business. So don't do like I did. Don't quit your job like I did until your passive income or net income from your business exceeds the income that you got from your nine to five job. You gotta replace that income. Next, you wanna set up your business the proper way so that your business qualifies for grants and loans and lines of credit, right? Many people missed out on the PPP loans due to this. And next, I want you to hire a lawyer to set up your business the correct way from a tax and legal standpoint. This cost us a lot of money in the end. And a sole proprietorship, that offers the least amount of protection, but it is quite common. Next, I want you to hire an accountant or a CPA to do your bookkeeping and your tax returns, right? They can help you discuss your goals and the financial health of your business. A CPA can help you understand your numbers, help you with a break-even analysis, your spending plan, your cash flow analysis right, your system analysis and compliance, they can help you with all of that, right? These are the things that we did not do or did too late the first time around. Hire a team, right? In addition to that attorney and that CPA, you need more help, outsource your weaknesses. Maybe you need an assistant for customer service or social media. Maybe you need a mentor or a coach in your field to help you more, become more successful quicker, Learn from their mistakes. Find the top person in that industry that you're in and learn from them and pay their fee. Their expertise, their knowledge can help you avoid losing a lot of money and making a lot of mistakes. But pay yourself too, right? You gotta pay yourself, you gotta pay your employees and you have to do it the proper way, right? Have the proper documentation so that when you're applying for loans and lines of credit for your business, you don't have any issues with that. And there are several ways to do this. QuickBooks, there's different payroll companies like ADP and Paychex, right? So make sure that you pay yourself and your employees the proper way. Next, I want you to have strong personal credit and strong business credit. I had it. But the downside is when the business is not successful. If you have both, you have funding opportunities on each side to leverage to grow and to scale your business without having to bootstrap everything out of your own pocket. Again, only leverage your personal credit if you understand the pros and cons of leveraging it. If you're okay with the risk, then go for it. If not, focus on building your business credit, all right? And when you get funding, when you get access to capital, because remember 29% of businesses fail due to lack of capital. Once you get this funding, have a plan, right? Have a plan. I don't care if it's business credit cards, personal credit cards, loans and lines of credit. So many entrepreneurs get money and they have no idea what to do with it. And some time may go by, that low interest rate is gonna go up. Those monthly payments are gonna be very expensive. And you didn't even leverage the funding that you received. And now you have more debt than when you began this process in the first place. Remember, the entire point of getting funding is to leverage it to make more money. You can leverage funding to help you grow and scale your business, again, or use it for passive income. And think about it like this. Every large corporation in the United States uses business credit from Facebook to Apple to Walmart and Microsoft. 
And they all leveraged it to get to as big as they are today, right? And how did they use it? They used it on inventory, expansion, staff, remodeling, vehicles, advertising. You can do the same thing with your business. Next, I want you to be selective in your partnerships, right? Be careful who you choose to be in business with. Maybe do a joint venture or a project first, right? Be sure to set up your operating agreement so everyone knows their roles and their responsibilities. Also, have provisions in place up front for how, how you want to dissolve the partnership one day. It's like a prenup, right? Set this up first. Don't wait until problems persist to figure out how to dissolve the partnership then. So it's very, very important to have attorneys draft legal documents and systems, right? All successful companies have systems and processes in place. You simply cannot grow or scale a business without it. So put those systems and processes in place for your business. And if that's not your area of expertise, then hire someone who can do it for you, okay? And last but not least, I don't want you to give up. Do not give up on your business. There will be tough times and you will make a lot of mistakes, but you must make mistakes in order to learn. Again, you can't learn everything from reading a book. You gotta take action. Right? So you will be amazed at what you accomplish when you don't give up. So being a firm believer that minor setbacks pave the way for major comebacks, I believe that I'm a better person and a better businesswoman because of all of the setbacks that I had to overcome. Right? I wouldn't be where I am today without this experience. So this has served as fuel, which ignites my passion to succeed. The comeback is greater than the setback. And I want the world to know that you can do anything that you set your mind to. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your educational level. It does not even matter about your upbringing. I never thought that I would live the life that I have today. And the only thing that could ever stop you or get in your way is a negative mindset, right? You can have whatever it is you want in this world. So it's really, really important to surround yourself with people who celebrate your success and go where you are celebrated, not just where you're tolerated. Thank you so much. What an amazing way to end the night. Thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give all of our speakers one final round of applause. Sadly, our time tonight has come to an end, but before you leave, we would like to thank our TEDx faculty sponsors, Andy Garman and Mitchell Cooper, and additional support from Michelle Murphy for helping put this wonderful virtual event together. We'd also like to thank Rush Media Services for help with production and editing. Lastly, a special thanks to the co-presidents, Micheline and Anna Paola, and the rest of the core committee, which includes myself, as speaker chair, Delia, committee liaison chair, Maddie, finance chair, Priya, social media chair, Sarah, marketing chair, Preeti, sponsorship chair, and our subcommittee members for the dedication to this year's TEDx RushU event. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate every audience member that joined us tonight. We are so grateful to have had the opportunity to make this a reality, despite the circumstances at hand. An additional heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers and our performer. We will now have a Q&A session where we'll be asking each speaker one question, and we encourage you to stay and listen to their insight that they have to share. We're going to proceed in the order that the speakers performed in. And for speakers, you may turn your videos on when it is your chance to answer, make sure to unmute. All right, so Dr. Joffrey Mount Varner, we're going to be starting with you. Your question from the audience is, you mentioned split second decisions. How do you ensure that a split second decision is not influenced by impulsivity or irrational thinking? Great question, thank you for that question. Um, so let me set up, the 
this way. We make about 35,000 decisions every day. Most of those are mundane and don't even matter, such as what to wear, what color pen to I use. But about one to 2% of those are life-changing and life-altering. And most of those are split-second decisions. And split second decisions are those decisions that we make when there's a when there's a time constraint, a lack of information and critical consequences. So when you when, when you define it that way, it's different from being impulsive. Thank you. Very insightful. And I definitely think a lot of us can use that in our everyday practice. So our next question is for Dr. Deandra Gordon. How can we teach the next generation of young black women to persevere past obstacles that they might encounter? Hi, thank you so much for the question. Um, my name is pronounced Diandra Gordon though. Um, so I think um, when I'm talking to young black women and um, encouraging them to persevere is, I talked about the framework that I used, um, HEART to hear, evaluate, assess, redirect, and transform. Um, and I think that is what you um, should tell black women in terms of um, how they can show up and still persevere despite the challenges. But one of the first aspects of the framework is to hear, but to take the information that you're hearing and really understanding that it is not, um, it's not law, it's not always truth. So really taking it and aligning it with what you your goals are, what you decide to do, who you decide to be and show up as, and then deciding to move on from there to take that information, evaluate, assess, um, redirect it if you need to, and decide to transform. But I think also um, showing Black women in um, areas and spaces that are positive um, and counteracting some of those other images that we see in media that don't necessarily tell us that we belong or that we're beautiful or that we're smart or that we are successful and really instilling that voice, listening to our young adults and our youth and really helping them to um, go where they wanna go. And then also, if you hear someone tell, tell you about their dream, if it's not something that you see or not something that you think that you can achieve, don't, um, don't shatter their dreams because it's not something that you think of. Let them go for their dreams, support them and their goals, and then give them whatever support and tool that you have. And it's not to encourage them not to do it. That's not supportive or a tool because you can't do it. So those are my thoughts and thank you for your question. Thank you so much. I think it's really important to empower one another. Our next question is for Susan Torres. And your question is, what was the title to the book in the pharmacy and the author? And then a secondary question was, what was the name of the support group that you joined? And is it still available today? Well, thank you for the questions. The, the name of the book was Women Who Love Too Much by Robin Norwood. And at the time it was a New York Times bestselling book. The, uh, the book consisted of raw and honest stories about women who were struggling in relationships and the connections between their childhood and their you know current status in their relationships and and for me that made um me think you know deeply about where i was at the time and how it connected to my childhood the support group i have to be honest i don't remember i think it was a generic type of support group you have to remember this was in Israel. It was in Mount Carmel and Haifa. It wasn't a very uh, metropolitan, cosmopolitan environment. But I do remember the people that um, helped me through that difficult time. And I think it was mainly talking out our troubles. So any support group probably would help people. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question is for Erica Battle, and the question is, how can we teach children to compartmentalize in a way that will allow them to still address their, their, their failures in a healthy way at a later time? Hi, thank you for that question. So um, one of the ways that we can have um, teach children to do that is by, first of all, asking them to kind of look at the acknowledging 
kind of like the formula said, acknowledging why they're hurt. You know, why was the rejection hurtful? Why was the disappointment hurtful? And then where do you need to put that, right? Um, do we need to put that in a space? Uh, we really need to take it away from ourselves because a lot of times what happens is, is we take rejection personally. So if we have an idea and we share an idea and people don't hold on to the idea, we automatically assume that they're rejecting us and not necessarily rejecting the idea that we just presented to them. And so we really have to have our kids take a look at, all right, what is the situation? Was the rejection about you or about something that you said? And then have them evaluate what can they do next? And I think that's one of the things that we don't allow our children the opportunity to do, which is reflect up on their disappointments and their failures so they can evaluate what to do next. We actually just kind of have them put them away and move on when we really need to make sure, and not just kids, but even adults, we need to acknowledge those moments when we're disappointed. So we can compartmentalize them and place them where they need to go instead of always internalizing everything and, and taking things personally. Thank you, Erica. That's very helpful. Our next question is for Dr. Konstantin Kanakis. And the question is, what is your best advice to all of us and to patients for accepting hard diagnoses? Thank you for that. That's a very good question. Um, I think getting a difficult diagnosis is a difficult situation, right? And it's a very human experience, right? So. My advice to people who receive difficult diagnoses is three things. First, give yourself the space to feel all the feelings you may have. You may be angry, you may be in denial, you may be struggling to accept it in whatever form that looks like for you. Um, but if it's a real diagnosis, if it's true and, and, and all that's squared up, then you know, give yourself the space to experience the feelings you have. Second, uh, you're gonna have to find or identify your support groups. You're gonna have to find the people whether they're your, you know, your doctors, your clinical team, your family, your friends, some some kind of community you belong to, you have to lean into that and and really use that for your own advantage. And finally, um, I would say, get educated about it. You know, yeah, I'm not saying go to, you know, great lengths to get degrees and go to school for it, but become the expert that you already will become because you're experiencing it firsthand. Um, being able to communicate. Um, that might be number four, uh, communicate with others your experience and share um, what's happening because the best thing you might be able to do is share your experience, which may change somebody else's life. Um, and that would be a very you know, salient and meaningful thing. So um, give yourself space, find your community, become the expert you already are and communicate. Good question. Thank you so much for breaking it down for us there. Yeah. <laughs> Our next question is for Dr. Ashley Bryant. The question is, what is one daily habit that keeps you grounded and on track? So one, well, so when we talk about daily habits that keep you grounded and on track towards reaching your goals, um, when you are creating goals, one of the things that you wanna make sure that you do is create not only the goal, but the roadmap that's gonna lead you to that particular goal. And as you create this roadmap, this roadmap is gonna consist of different tasks that need to be done to help you reach that goal. And so what you can do is take those tasks and um, assign them a day and time as to when you're gonna work on those particular things. And I would say pick no more than two things. You don't wanna overwhelm yourself with a bunch of tasks to do every single day. Because what happens is whenever we have this long to-do list, we end up doing nothing. So just pick one or two things that we're gonna do every day to work on that particular goal. And if we are consistent enough with it, then we're gonna get to the point where we've checked it all off and then we're at that goal. So I would say the daily thing that you can do is to um, just, just chew at it one bit at a time. Don't feel like you have to accomplish everything all at once. Thank you. I'll definitely incorporate that into my every day. And our last question for the night, um, and a similar take, 
however, from a different perspective is for Latoya Jackson. What strategies do you use to stay accountable to your goals? I didn't hear you that clearly. Oh, I'll say it again. What strategies do you use to stay accountable to your goals? Oh, that's a good question. I think the strategy is really have an accountability partner. Um, it's one thing to have your own goals, you know, for your business or whether it's a personal or business goals. But if you have someone that can keep you accountable for your goals, I feel like that can keep you on track. So whether it's your sales goal, your revenue goal, your activity goal, or maybe you want to lose some weight, right? If you have a partner that can support you and help you and, you know, you guys talk regularly about where you are against those goals, I think that's extremely helpful. Thank you so much. And I think that kind of is a good um, topper to all of this is to look for support in other people, look to others to help you reach goals, to gain information and insight. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you to everybody who attended tonight, all of our speakers, our performers, our sponsors, and everyone who helped us along the way. We're extremely grateful and happy that we were able to achieve this event. And again, we thank you for coming out. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for having me as well. Thanks for having me too. Thanks for everybody who watched and tuned in and asked all the wonderful questions. Good Thank luck to everyone. <laughs>